Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. I think we've got some serious erosion of just commonplace, settled law, civil rights. Roe versus Wade in jeopardy. Low-income people have a better standard of living if you're willing to set a higher floor for wages. Where Louisiana stands on minimum wage. The leading cause of maternal death was actually substance use disorder. A Senate bill reveals a dangerous trend among Louisiana's pregnant women. I'm really thankful that I've been able to have that impact on people. Introducing you to our last young hero. Hi everyone, I'm Kara St. Cyr. And I'm Andre Moro. The U.S. is trudging into what could become another COVID-19 surge. Cases rising, hospitalizations rising, the new Obicon subvariant seen mostly in the Northeast and also Southern California is expected to wash over the nation. Keeping the surge in check, experts say, is a higher level of immunity. But there are unknowns and it comes after a two-month decline. Cases in Louisiana, again, are on the rise. Also this week, the death of one of the EBR sheriff's deputies shot during the 2016 ambush following Alton Sterling's death. Nick Toulier died Thursday morning from an infection. A large procession took Toulier from Our Lady of the Lake Hospital in Baton Rouge to Denham Springs. Toulier was badly wounded and many felt it was miraculous that he fought the odds to live this long. Governor John Bell Edwards asked that flags be lowered to have staff at government buildings as a tribute. In a statement, he said that Toulier and the other officers injured during that ambush were true heroes who fiercely loved their community that they vowed to protect. Toulier spent the last six years of his life in and out of hospitals. He was 46 years old. And now to news making headlines across the state. A bill to keep transgender women and girls in the state from competing on college and K-12 women's and girls sports teams moved a step closer to passage. The governor opposes it. He vetoed it last year, but has not said if he'd veto again this year. Legislators and committee rejected the Don't Say Gay bill for public schools in the state. Representative Dodie Horton's bill would have prohibited a teacher or school employee from discussing his own sexual orientation or gender identity with students K-12. Opponents say the ban would have been too broad, also barring educational or historical information from being taught. A critical shortage of Louisiana teachers spurred the House to pass legislation to try and lure some retired teachers back to the classroom. It would increase earnings without reducing retirement benefits. It passed 96 to 0. The bill applies to those certified to teach math, science, English language arts, and any teacher's aid. The Saints tweeted, done deal for the Honey Badger to come back home. LSU and pro football great Tyran Matthew signed to play in the city where he grew up. Three years, $33 million. Matthew says it's a dream come true. Fans in Louisiana are ecstatic. This is LSU's Tiger Stadium this past Saturday night. A jam-packed crowd estimated at 120,000 to see Garth Brooks perform. When the 60-year-old entertainer sang Call in Baton Rouge, the eruption of cheers was so great, it registered as a small earthquake on the seismograph at LSU.
of a draft from the Supreme Court this week ignited both sides of the abortion issue. The draft was not final, but it said the court was on the verge of overturning the law of the land on abortion since 1973, Roe v. Wade. So what does this mean for our state, Louisiana? Let's start right there with first Mary Patricia Ray, who is the founder of Top Drawer Strategies, a government relations political consulting PR firm, also adjunct professor at Tulane University, and Dr. Melissa Flournoy, who chairs the board of Louisiana Progress, past executive director of Planned Parenthood for the Gulf Coast region, and a former state legislator. Mary Patricia, I'm going to begin with you and the law because I'm curious, Louisiana, one of 13 states where abortion would become automatically illegal, is that in all circumstances? And what are the far reaching Louisiana points of is that? one of 13 states that has a trigger law. The exceptions under this opinion, should it become final, are a little ambiguous and unclear. Uh, the opinion states that there can be exceptions in the case where a life sustaining organ is at stake um, for the childbearing person. Um, it's not yet clear what that's going to mean, but we know that um, historically the number of women seeking an abortion does not change whether it is legal or not. The number that changes changes is the number of women who die trying to get an abortion and that will certainly be the case here in Louisiana and across the country should this opinion become final. Melissa, what does this uh, practically speaking uh, mean for impacting women in our state? Well, right now Louisiana has three uh, clinics that provide abortion, one in Shreveport, one in, Lu in Baton Rouge, and one in New Orleans. And so those clinics are still operating until this uh, Supreme Court uh, decision is is uh, formally released. Uh, but as Mary Patricia said, you know, women have been having abortions uh, for millennia. Since women got pregnant, women have had abortions. And so my real concern is we're going to go back to the dark ages where, um, you know, women were having self-induced abortions, women were having abortions sort of in the back alley. You know, abortion has only been legal and safe since 19. 73 and we are about to jeopardize the health of a whole new generation of, of girls and women. There were rallies that sprang up all over the country uh, yesterday, um, one at the state capitol at 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon. What was the turnout like? Uh, we had over 100 people. We had a lot of groups co-sponsor on very short notice. So we've got Lift Louisiana, Planned Parenthood, AAUW, the YWCA, ACLU, Louisiana Progress. So there's a lot of energy res in response to this uh, attack on the rights of women uh, to control their own bodies. So I was pleased with the immediate response. And so we're going to have to have a longer term strategy to mobilize and fight back. I'm curious, uh, Mayor Patricia, about the draft. Were the arguments persuasive? And what else? could it mean um, from the arguments we're using? Great question, Andre. And we're really in some unknown territory in terms of the credibility of our Supreme Court. Um, regardless of who leaked this information, what we've got before us is a draft opinion that is really unlike any other opinion I've ever seen from the court. Some of the citations in this opinion support the argument that there is no constitutional right to abortion by citing things like English legal precedent. precedent. Um, men um, and authors who were famous for um, hanging women for being witches or supporting the concept of marital rape. And these are the sources that are cited in support of this argument. Um, so so these aren't recent <laughs> sightings either. These no, go hundreds of years back. No, but what is recent wow. um, is that this case not only would overturn Roe, it would overturn Planned Parenthood v. Casey and all the progeny of Roe v. Wade um, since it, the original opinion. It affects cases that rely on a privacy argument that is set up in those prior um, opinions um, to support fundamental rights like the right to contraception, the right to same-sex marriage, um, and so other things that affect people's quality of life, their health, and actually their ability to stay alive. Um, those opinions are being kind of jostled uh, by this one should it become final. I, th I think we've got some serious erosion of just commonplace settled law civil rights that have been established over the last 50 years. Do you see this, as you read it, as something that will happen, or could you see it changing before 
it gets to that point. Well, we had a very interesting know. statement from the um, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He said that this opinion, although it's a valid document and is what it alleges to be, is not final um, and that it, it does not represent a final uh, vote of the court on this opinion. So there is still time for um, it to change and we know that the Chief Justice is looking more for um, a, a more restricted access to abortion himself rather than maybe going this far. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see how the court handles this and whether they can regain some of their own credibility and legitimacy. Thank you very much, both of you, for being here. I appreciate it so much. Thank Thanks you. for having us, Andre. Louisiana is ranked number one for the highest maternal mortality rate in the country. For every 100,000 pregnant women, about 58 will die here. Last week, the legislature contemplated a bill that could possibly change that. Dr. Veronica Gillespie-Bell with the Louisiana Department of Health explains how to curb Louisiana's maternal mortality rate. Senate Bill 60 was introduced in the Capitol last week. The bill would require pregnant women to undergo tests for illegal drug use. Though legislation didn't have the support it needed to become a law, it did reveal issues among one of Louisiana's most vulnerable populations, pregnant women. So based on our 2018 review, which was our last report, um, the leading cause of maternal death was actually substance use disorder, followed by motor vehicle collisions and then homicide. Veronica Gillespie-Bell is the medical director of the Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative Mortality Review. Her job is to study and compile information on mortality rates among pregnant women and babies. The last completed report from 2018 showed that accidental overdose was the most common cause of death in pregnant women. The report went on to say that drug use accounted for 37 percent of pregnancy-associated deaths. Because through the maternal mortality review, we don't look at the particular type of substance that they um, died from. I can say that in reviewing cases this year, we are seeing um, some newer, newer types of drugs. We're seeing more fentanyl and we're seeing more of the synthetic um, medications and drugs making it into our homicide deaths. In 2021, the Louisiana Department of Health recorded over 300 hospital admissions of babies born with neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. The increase in fentanyl and opioid overdoses is consistent with the rest of the country. Following the start of the pandemic, the U.S. saw a surge in drug usage and drug-related deaths. It's not enough to screen, but we have to be able to offer our patients treatment. And we also have to work on our stigma and our bias, um, which is one of the things that we also do with our birthing facilities through the ISED initiative. Mothers will not come forward to even admit that they are using substances um, when they are afraid that they're going to lose their children or that they're going to be criminalized um, for having substances in their system. Um, and so we have to destigmatize the way we treat those individuals so they feel comfortable coming forward. If we are doing um, any harm by doing a blood test where we're um, checking everyone's blood and then there may be ramifications for that, we're actually, uh, that could make us have worse maternal outcomes because mothers will not come in to seek care. Gillespie Bell says that the Department of Health drafted initiatives to reduce overdoses and fatalities in pregnant women. The initiatives focus heavily on preventative measures and therapy. Senate Bill 60 was postponed for this session. The author, Senator Stuart Cathy, said he'd be willing to find ways to reduce overdose deaths with the Louisiana Department of Health and DCFS. At the state capitol, Republicans blocked a number of bills that would have raised the state minimum wage. This was at the end of last week. The minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. It ties Louisiana with six other states for having the lowest minimum wage. Jan Moeller, executive director of the Louisiana Budget Project, is the man to talk to on this issue. My question first, among many, is why do lawmakers, why do business leaders block this every single time saying it's going to hurt the economy? Well, I can't speak for the business lobby on this, but it really is like Groundhog Day at the Louisiana legislature because every year this issue comes up. We know that this is very popular with the public. Every poll I've ever seen of Louisiana voters show that up to 80% of voters support. 
across party lines, across racial lines, all support the need to raise the minimum wage. Everybody understands that $7.25 an hour is simply unacceptable yeah. in today's economy, especially with prices going up. But um, the business lobby fights this every single year, and every single year in the House Labor Committee, they manage to convince enough legislators to vote it down. They simply don't think government has any role in setting wages for businesses uh, but all the research that we've seen yeah. shows the opposite, that you really can help hundreds of thousands of hardworking people, low-income people, have a better standard of living if you're willing to set a higher floor for wages. A, a higher, slightly standard of living. And also the data across the board shows that this stimulates the economy, that it doesn't drive people out of business or in the tank. And that's the that's the fear we're here all the time. Oh, my we can't pay that. Absolutely. No, you've heard from the opponents of minimum wage that if you raise the minimum wage, you were going to kill jobs. Right. There has been just an enormous amount of research that says exactly the opposite, that when you put more money in people's pockets, they, uh, especially low-income workers, they spend that money in their community, mm -hmm. and that spending, in turn, stimulates a uh, economy and creates jobs. Now, I'm sure there are levels at which you could set the minimum wage where maybe it would have the opposite effect, but we're talking about modest increases, going to 10, 11, $12 an hour, which, uh, you know, again, you couldn't get a job in some cities Correct. in this country that pay that little. But here right. in Louisiana, that would be a substantial raise for hundreds of thousands of people, particularly workers of color, people who work in retail, who work in low level healthcare jobs. Um, People we see every day who work hard Absolutely. and simply don't make enough money to, to make ends meet. Many of them frontline workers, exactly. as we recall, right? Two years ago, we were calling them heroes, yes. and now we are saying that they don't deserve a simple raise. And and you bring up the point there that this is not going from seven twenty five to $15 in one moment, that it's an incremental increase. Uh, Representative Marcel, that was her pitch. It was shot down. Uh, again, this is the argument we hear uh, that it's going to break us. A absolutely not. It is going to, what it's going to do is, you know, w one thing people forget about poverty in Louisiana and everywhere is that most poor people, almost all poor households, uh, have somebody who works uh, and, and this, they go to work every day and the jobs simply don't pay enough to stay above water. And so if you raise people's wages, you know, you're really not talking about even bringing people into the middle class, True. but maybe just having enough to make ends meet so that they can, uh, you know, put food on the table every week, every month, pay the rent, uh, buy clothes for their kids. That's what we're talking about, a decent wage. Um, at, at a what, minimum, at a minimum, truly, too. We're not talking about We're talking about a minimum here. wage. Yeah. We know it's going to stimulate the economy. One thing, um, you know, the Annie E. Casey Foundation puts out a kids count uh, ranking every year uh, that looks at how children are doing in each state, and they count it by a number of metrics, and they do yes. it for every single state. Louisiana has always been 48th, 49th, and 50th. Uh, one of the states that were, you know, just ahead of Louisiana for years was Arkansas. They used to be around, you know, 45, 46, mm -hmm. a little bit ahead of Louisiana. A few years ago, they started raising their minimum wage in, yes. in, in Arkansas. They did it by referendum. The people in Arkansas voted to raise the minimum wage. And one thing that happened when that happened, uh, when the minimum wage went up, is that their rankings on the kid count started to go up. So they are actually now in the mid 30s. Wow. Uh, and so. Uh, and you how's know, this, we, the state of Arkansas doing? Are they collapsing? They're under not this collapsing. Right. Arkansas, I mean, Arkansas has problems just like Louisiana has problems. But right. when you measure by, by the welfare of children in, in Arkansas, they are doing better. Uh, relative to other states than they were just a few years earlier. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that families have a little bit more money in their pocket. So many of the problems that we associate, crime, yes, exactly. dysfunction, um, mental health, there are so many factors that correlate with poverty. And the best way to, uh, to fight poverty is, is simple. People need money. And I really believe that legislators, for the most part, try really hard to represent the people back home, to represent their wishes at the Capitol. This is one of those issues where the, the will of the people simply is not represented right. in the votes of the people in the legislature. And uh, I'm confident that one day we will, uh, we will change the direction, but, but this is, won't be the year. It won't be soon enough for everybody, though. You and the Louisiana Budget Project are on top of this all the time. Thank you, Jan. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.
Mason McCart is a 17-year-old with a knack for community service, and it all started during the pandemic. He started a blog to help his peers cope with mental struggles, and he started a baking business intended to help those in need. Tonight, I'm taking you to Natchitoches for this week's Young Hero. I'm Mason McCart, and I'm 17, and I go to St. Mary's Catholic School. I'm really just social, and I'm a really big social butterfly. I just love to go around and meet new people and just learn a lot about others. So it's really, I think that's how I would be described. But Mason wasn't always that way. There was a time when his parents would have called him an introvert with a shy disposition. He was really pretty quiet and reserved and um, just with others, I guess. He didn't, didn't do much. He, he, was, he was shut in a lot. And then it started, uh, with social media, a bad influence to a lot of a lot of people, uh, but he took it and used it to, to to gain personal growth from. Social media was the beginning of his transformation. During the pandemic, feelings of isolation and loneliness were starting to surface, but the internet provided an outlet. So, <laughs> I started this blog when I started cooking for your cause. <laughs> and, uh, um, I really started posting on it because I felt like I felt the impact of negative mental health when I was in quarantine. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone, like all of my friends and all of just my mutual friends, that they were able to have resources and that they could, they knew that they could talk to me if they were ever having issues. And so I started this blog just as an outlet for me to honestly just advocate saying, hey, like, it's all right, like everything will get better eventually. And so I really just started this to sort of make sure everyone knows that they have a friend. And I think that's one of the most important things to know because in high school, it's one of the hardest times uh, for a person in life. And so just knowing that you have someone to lean on whenever you are going through uh, times of trial and tribulations, I think that's really just necessary for kids my age to have. The blog is called allsmileshere.org. Mason purchased the domain so he could keep everything going throughout the outbreak. I would say my most viewed post um, it was like 120 views. I was very um, happy to be able to have that outreach and I have had multiple people just come up and talk to me about it and just saying about how it's helped them get through hard times. I'm really thankful that I've been able to have that impact on people. But this wasn't Mason's only breakthrough during the pandemic. When schools closed, he thought up an idea to bake and sell banana bread, but he was met with some resistance to that idea. And I said, well, baby, you know, can't just go around selling banana bread uh, and we're in quarantine. You know, you can't, it's just not safe right now. People are not going to want to be buying uh, banana bread when, you know, this quarantine, you know, we're quarantined and the COVID virus is going around and we really didn't know much about it. So um, he said, well, I'd like to, I don't want to keep the money, mama. I want it to go to, a, you know, to needy people. And that's what he did. When schools opened back up in August 2020, Mason asked his school principal if he could walk the halls and sell cookies he baked. He got the green light to create what's now called Cooking with a Cause. So Cooking for a Cause is a, really it is a baking club where we just sell baked goods every single week and we donate the proceeds to an organization or a charity or an individual in need. And so we've donated to places such as the Women's Resource Center in Natchitoches or just a teacher at my school who had COVID and we really just wanted to help uh, with everything with that. So it really just, we donate to people who are in need and people who we think could really use this. And so we collect the proceeds every month. It's a new person every single month or a new organization every month that we donate to. They call me the cookie man. <laughs> I was just hoping to donate maybe $100 to the Women's Resource Center, like the Arnaca Humane Society. And then within six months, we had someone donate $5,000 to help um, endow a scholarship uh, fund that we were donating to. So we ended up being able to donate over $6,000 to help endow the scholarship. And that was really shell, like that was just shell talking to me. Like I was just like, almost, I, was, I, I was just so surprised whenever we were able to do that. So really just, I did not think we would get this far. The blog and Cooking for a Cause are only one part of Mason's life. The rest of it is pretty busy. He's a mascot for St. Mary's Catholic School. He plays tennis and runs cross country. And it doesn't stop there. Mason is beta president for the state of Louisiana. He's also a member of the National Honor Society. 
And that's just to name a few of his accomplishments. I like to keep myself busy. I always love just being out, but I really do appreciate the quiet time that I have. But I really just love just giving back to the community and working in the community with others and serving others. He never meets a stranger. He's just always going and helping others and doing things. But um, we're just very proud of him and who he's become. He's got some time before college to figure it all out. But until then, Mason will continue to lead an inspiring life full of community service. Mason says that he's interested in film and business, so when he finishes up his senior year, we'll see where that takes him. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be a good place. We've introduced seven wonderful high schoolers. It was a pleasure getting to meet each and every one of you. We have no doubt that each of you will go on to do great things. So the best of luck to you all. And thank you to the generous sponsors who supported this year's Young Heroes. AmeriHealth Caritas, Louisiana, the East Baton Rouge Parish Library, Community Coffee, the U.S. Army Baton Rouge Recruiting Battalion, Demco, and Hotel Indigo. And everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB PBS app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please, like us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.